This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. All right, this is the uh, second lecture on, what was it, I think the third chapter, but the strategy formulation and um, financial performance. And I really do hope you did what I asked. And that example, um, Repsy, I hope you did spend five minutes and just jot down key points. And as I said before, if it does, if something like this does come in your exam, just have a table of every ratio for every year will not get you that many marks. It's important just to look at key features of it and to make sensible comments. And so, it's a pity we're not here, otherwise I'd ask you to give me uh, your comments. Uh, obviously I can't, so you'll have to listen to mine. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think the first thing of all, the most important thing of all to look at, is the growth in turnover. That really is the most important thing to comment of all. Uh, because I don't care for the minute how much profit or loss uh, they're making. The vital thing is that turnover is growing. Because if turnover isn't growing, how can we make more profit? Okay, they can perhaps cut costs. But, you know, there's a limit to how much you can ever cut costs. The only way to achieve growth in the long term is to keep the revenue growing. And it has grown. You don't even need to do any numbers here. It's gone uh, from 43,800 in uh, the first year up to 59,000 in the fourth year. There has been consistent growth each year. If you want the overall growth over the whole period, uh, it's gone up by what? It's 59,000 as against in the first, oh dear, first year 43,800. And so in percentage terms, how much has it gone up by? It's gone up by 11.9% uh, over the whole period. And okay, we've nothing to compare it with, you know, how have similar companies grow, no idea. But you've got to make that comment. Turnover's been growing on its own, that's good. Uh, and in fact, to do more arithmetic is wasting time. There wouldn't be that many marks purely for the arithmetic. All right, you could work out the growth each year, but so what? I can see at a glance, it is growing each year, and overall it's gone up by nearly 20% over the period. Uh, what else? Um, well, of course, profits do matter, clearly. Uh, and for the reason I said before, um, it did profit before interest and tax that we're concerned about primarily. You know, we've no mention here of depreciation, so we can't do a bit there. Uh, but what's been the growth in the profit before interest and tax? Uh, uh, uh. Again, by all means, look year by year, but it clearly is increasing each year. There's no real need to go into so much detail. Overall, it's, got, uh, it's 7,550 as against 5,100. And so the percentage growth has gone up by 2,450 divided by 5,100. It's gone, good heavens, is my arithmetic right now? I wrote down the wrong figures. Oh, good heavens. Profit before interest and tax, it's 11,300 as against 8,7. And so in percentage terms, what am I good day? It's gone up by 29.9%, 30%. Um, 
which is extraordinary, really. Uh, it's gone up much, much more than the revenue. Uh, you could start doing more investigating, but I did say, I just wanted five or six critical points. I think there are a few more important points rather than start analysing in detail. Uh, but by all means, if there were more marks available in the exam, you could look at uh, cost of sales as a percent of turnover, you could look at salaries and wages, and so on. And salaries and wages, of course, looking at them, they've fallen. And so certainly that expense has gone down, which has contributed um, to the profit going up more than the revenue. So that's a good sign as well. Uh, what else? Oh, very, very standardly, the return on capital employed. Uh, the most basic ratio of all, the most important ratio of all, which uh, yet again should be revision, but the return on um, capital employed um, in the first year, uh, well, it's the uh, profits before interest and tax, which is 8.7, expressed as a percentage of the total long term capital, which um, is shareholders' funds, which in the first year was 22,600, plus the long term debt, the long term borrowing 11,300 which as a percentage is 8.7 divided by 33,900, 25.6%. By all means do it every year, but don't have to waste time. Uh, by the fourth year, the profit of registered tax was 11,300. Uh, Long-term capital, Shareholders sums 48,400, long term debt 1,900. Which I think is 22.5%. Um, which all right, it's gone down, and uh, in a minute, I'm not sure I would do this in the exam, it depends how many marks there are. In a minute, we can look as to why perhaps it's gone down, although the fall isn't dramatic. Uh, and also, of course, what I'd be very interested in is looking at uh, companies in the same industry. What's their level of return on capital employed? You know, if they're getting 10%, we're still doing extremely well. If they're getting 30%, Clearly, we're doing pretty badly. Uh, certainly, I'd look at term on capital employed there. I'd say that, all right, it's gone down. That's, uh, we're not happy about that. It's not a dramatic fall. Uh, if you remember, again, from earlier exams, we can try and analyse and see what's happened. Uh, although, again, it depends how many marks that were available in the exam as to whether it's worth it. But the way we can analyse, uh, we can look at the gross profit margin, or sorry, the net profit margin. What percentage profit are they making on the sales? So what I mean there is the profit before interest and tax in the first year again is 8.7. Uh, the turnover, the revenue was 43.800. So they're uh, getting a net profit margin of or were 19.9 percent, whereas by the time we got to um, the fourth year, where obviously um, the company's a lot bigger, the profit had gone up to 11.3, the turnover to 59, and so the profit margin Um, is 19.2 percent. So okay, it's gone down slightly. Uh, again, it, it's hardly worth commenting on. It's um, the difference is minimal. But you know, if it had gone down more, I'd be more worried. But it could be, for instance, 
that one of the reasons we've managed to sell a lot more, maybe we dropped the selling price a bit, and therefore uh, a lower profit margin. Uh, when I say we can analyse it, the return on capital, uh, I think clearly if the profit margin goes down, that in itself will pull down the return on capital. Uh, the other standard thing we can look at, though, is the asset turnover. Uh, the asset turnover As the company gets bigger, you expect to sell more, I think clearly. And so, with asset turnover, we're looking at the sales relative to the size of the company, relative to the uh, long-term capital. Now, the asset turnover is the turnover, the sales 43,800, divided by size of the company, the total long-term capital. And the total long-term capital of the company uh, we had before share capital plus long-term borrowings, which is equal to the net assets, of course, 33,900. And so the asset turnover in the first year is 1.29. We leave that as a number generally rather than a percent. So we would say the turnover was 1.29 times uh, the long-term capital. What was it in the fourth year? The turnover went up to 59. The long-term capital, the total net assets, 5,300. So bigger company, more turnover. But what's the ratio? Uh, 1.17. So again, that's gone down as well, and it's those two together determine the return on capital employed. If you multiply the two together, 19.9 times 1.29, check me, but you will get 25.6%. 19.2 times 1.17, you will get 22.5. So profit margin is down, it's marginal, but obviously lower profit margin we want to investigate. Asset turnover is down. That doesn't look too um, helpful. Although, of course, don't just, you know, this isn't the baby, um, the first three baby papers for ACCA. Uh, talk a bit sensibly, look round it. I remember the company did have a rights issue uh, in the third year. In the third year, the company suddenly became a lot bigger, presumably. That was invested, well, it was invested in uh, more assets, presumably more non-current assets. Uh, and it may take a while for the new assets to start earning good money. And so uh, that could be the problem, that you see, um, the assets have gone up a lot. Hopefully they will and they have earned us generated more revenue, but perhaps the full benefit is yet to come through, uh, uh, and things may not be uh, at all of a problem, we don't know. Anyway, I'm going on far too long here, let's uh, see any other points we can make. Uh, oh, look at the P ratios. Talk about P-E ratios again in uh, one or two later chapters. But the P-E ratio, remember, is, well, is the market value of shares, market value per share. Oh dear. Divided by the earnings per share. Uh, and what was it? Uh, well, there was, uh, in year one, the P-E ratio for Repsi was 17. And what does it mean? It means that if the earnings were going to be constant, shareholders are prepared to pay 17 times the earnings. For the industry, they were prepared to pay 18 times the earnings. 
Why on earth should they uh, pay 17 times the earnings or 18 times the earnings? Well, the amount they pay depends on the growth they're expecting in the future. Whatever the current earnings are, the more you expect earnings to grow in the future, the more you'll pay for the share. And the more you pay for the share, divided uh, the market value by the current earnings, the more you pay for the share, the higher the P-E ratio will be. Now again, because you've seen it before, or should have, I don't want to go on and on here, but do be clear, a higher P-E uh, suggests investors are expecting higher future growth. And of course, higher future growth uh, is, is good, obviously. You'll pay more for the share accordingly. And what's happened here, I'm not going to write on the screen, uh, but in year one, RP was a bit lower than that of the industry as a whole. Shells were expecting us to grow less fast than the industry as a whole. Which I wouldn't be too happy about. But over the four years, the P ratio has consistently increased. Which means year by year, shells have become more optimistic. And, you know, in year four, it's gone up to 19. So they're now expecting uh, higher growth than they were four years ago. Higher future growth. And we've overtaken the industry. The P ratio now is higher than that of the industry as a whole. Uh, and so again, our shareholders expect, they think, that we're going to grow faster in the future than other companies in the industry. So that's a good sign. Uh, we don't know why they expect it, what information they've got and so on. But certainly shareholders are expecting higher growth. What else, what else? Well, without going on and on and on, I think another key thing, have I done five or six, I think I have, uh, another key thing uh, is the gearing. Now, I'm not going to have a lecture on gearing here. It does become very relevant in later calculations, I'll talk more about it then. But again, this should be revision, it should be clear <laughs> basically what we mean. Uh, there are two things you can look at with gearing. Uh, one is the ratio, sorry, gearing is measuring the level of debt in the company. And so uh, one thing you can look at is the gearing ratio itself. Uh, the ratio of long-term debt to shareholders funds, which in the first year, debt was 11.3, shareholders funds are 22.600. So it was... Fifty percent, uh, whereas in the fourth year, again looking year by year, is rather unnecessary. Uh, but in the fourth year, debt was nineteen hundred, equity forty-eight four, uh, three point nine percent. Uh, now, before I say anything about that. In case any of you are worried, you may remember there are actually two different ways of measuring the gearing ratio. Here, I've done it as debt over equity. Instead, you could measure it as debt over debt plus equity. So the equity 22,600, the debt 11,3. So debt is a proportion of the total long term capital. And if you chose that measure, Then in the first year, the gearing will be 33%, uh, whereas in the fourth year, uh, using this measure, it would be... Oh, it's done it again, sorry. 
uh, uh, 3.8%. Uh, so there's two different ways of measuring gearing. In the exam, it doesn't matter. As long as you're consistent, clearly, you either compare those two or you compare those two. Doesn't matter which you do, unless obviously the exam is specified, which is unlikely. But whichever way we're measuring it, the gearing has fallen substantially. Uh, and remember, there's no perfect level of gearing. Uh, if it's if gearing's too high, it makes things more risky for the shareholders, so we don't want it to be too high. Uh, on the other hand, debt borrowing's attractive because it gets tax relief. The interest is tax allowable, and that's what makes it attractive. Uh, however, I will talk more about gearing later, even though this really should be revision. Uh, here, you can't say a lot. It did look fairly high in the first year, certainly by the fourth year it's negligible and of course we we uh, know why. They have that rights issue. And look at the figures. Shareholders' funds went up substantially in the third year and in the third year the long-term borrowing went down and so quite clearly quite a lot of the money that was raised from shareholders was used to repay uh, the debt. Uh, one problem though is we've only used book values of debt and equity, which can be very misleading. The other thing we can look at though, uh, to do with gearing, is the interest cover. Uh, which measures how uh, easily the company is able currently to uh, pay the interest. So the interest cover, in year one we take the profit before interest and tax, 8, 7. Uh, we divide by the interest. And gets uh, 7.25. And before I make any comment... If you look at the fourth year, profit went up to 11.3, the interest went down to 150. And so the interest cover at 75.3. And what's the relevance of that? You see, if the interest cover is very low, you know, just suppose the interest cover was 1.2. That'd be very scary because it means it would only need a very small drop in the um, earnings before we were unable to pay the interest uh, and therefore could perhaps be forced to liquidate. Uh, here, all right, the earnings were seven times the interest, so there wasn't really any problem. The earnings could fall quite a bit before we had a problem. Now, of course, <laughs> no problem, interest would have to falling no sorry earnings would have to fall enormously before we couldn't pay the interest uh, there's certainly no problem at all all right i'll look at one last thing remember and i think it was the first section i said the the fundamental objective is to maximize shareholders wealth we maximize shareholders wealth by increasing the share price well, we can calculate the share price, the market value of the shares. And how can we calculate? Well, I wrote down before, and you should already have been aware, that the P-E ratio is the earnings per share divided by, uh, sorry, the market value of the share divided by the earnings per share. So the market value is the P ratio times the earnings per share. Well, in year one, we know what our P ratio was. It was 17. The earnings per share, well, it's the profit after interest and tax, which was 5,100, divided by the number of shares, 9,000. So earnings per share, 
57 cents multiplied by 17. Uh, the share price, $9.64. Uh, I won't do it year by year. If you want, I'll go yourself. There's a printed answer at the back of the notes, of course. But by the fourth year, the P was 19. Earnings per share, uh, 7,550. Number of shares. We'd have the rights issue, so they've got 12,000. Uh, what do I get? I get $11.95. So we certainly fulfilled our objective there. The share price has gone up. And in addition, of course, given there was a rights issue, we don't know the details. But the shareholders now have more shares, which probably, well, almost certainly is a rights issue, they'd have been able to buy cheaply. So always round, uh, shareholders certainly seem to have gained. Uh, you could work out the total market cap capitalization, the total um, value, the, the total value of equity. We know the share price. We know the number of shares. So in total, equity was worth nine thousand times nine dollars sixty-four. By the fourth year, it's twelve thousand times eleven dollars ninety-five. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I've spent uh, quite a long time there, even though I only gave you five minutes. But uh, I would have been quicker if I had to have been talking at the same time. Uh, there are other things you could have looked at. There are things you may have looked at. Uh, you have a look at the answer. I've looked at a couple of other, uh, checked a couple of other things in the uh, answer at the back of the notes.